Hi, everyone. Welcome to the third session of crypto. The session is about uh, outsourcing and delegating computation. The first talk is Optimal Verification of Operations on Dynamic Sets uh, by Babis Papamantu, Roberto Tomasia, and Nikos Triandopoulos. And Babis will give the talk. Is it on? Okay. Uh, hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to my talk. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, the work I did uh, in my PhD thesis, uh, optimal verification of operations on dynamic sets. And this is joint work with my advisor at Brown University, Roberto Tomasia, and my collaborator uh, at RSA Labs, uh, Nikos Triandopoulos. Uh, so, we're all familiar with the proposition of the cloud, and uh, since uh, we started using the cloud extensively in our lives, the security community started working on several security problems, and specifically, the two most important ones is first, data privacy. So, for example, when we put our data online and we encrypt them, we like the server that is going to make use of our data to be able to actually use them in a meaningful way. Okay, so to deal with this problem, several solutions have been proposed for computation on encrypted data. So this is the first aspect of security problem that comes with, uh, with cloud computing. And the second uh, aspect of security of cloud computing is data and computation's integrity. So basically, we know that when we put our data online, a server is malicious and wants to, uh, to tamper with uh, our data. And we would like to have some guarantees that the answers that we get back from the server are as if uh, they have been uh, computed locally, basically. So as if the data have not been tampered or have not been accessed by anyone else. Okay, so we want some correctness guarantees on the computation that is executed remotely by some untrusted uh, uh, party. And in order to, to deal with these problems, uh, we, have, we can use authenticated data structures and verifiable delegation of computation. And the main difference between these two paradigms is the fact that authenticated data structures allow someone to publicly verify some answer, some computation, whereas the verifiable delegation of computation framework uh, involves some kind of secret key settings which uh, inherently supports one specific user. This talk it's not going to be about privacy, but it's going to be about checking the integrity of computations that uh, happen, uh, that occur remotely. Okay, specifically, we're going to look into verifying outsourced computation in the authenticated data structures model. Okay, so one motivation for, for this work that we're going to present here is, for example, searching your Gmail inbox. So what happens when you go and you use your Gmail, you want to search your emails. And you can give conjunctive queries, so return the emails that have the terms Brown and Berkeley. Or disjunctive queries, for example, return the emails that have terms thesis or publication. Okay. And what happens is that these conjunctive and disjunctive queries are implemented through an inverted index. So its keyword is mapped to a set of emails. And when you're looking to retrieve the emails that contain a certain combination of keywords, you would like to compute an intersection of the sets. Okay? So all these operations basically boil down to set operations. And uh, this is what we're going to study here. How you can efficiently verify set operations that are being computed remotely. So in order to do that, we're going to use the formal model of authenticated data structures to present our results. So this model involves the following parties. We have a source that is the owner of the data, and we trust, which computes a state, an authenticated state of the data, and outsources along with an authenticated data structure to an untrusted server. Okay, so you can view the, the digest as a signature on our data. Okay. And so the server has the trusted source's data, and we have a client that would like to send queries to the data, receive some answers back, and based on the trust he has on the source, to verify that the answer coming back from the server is correct. Okay, so the server comes back with an answer and a proof, basically. Okay, 
So this is the model of authenticated data structures. And what we're interested, and of course the client per performs some verification. What we're interested in minimizing is the complexity of this model. So basically how long does it take, for example, to do an update of the data set that lies both at the source and the server? How long does it take for the server to compute a proof? This is the query complexity. How long does it take to verify and so on and so forth? And of course, we want to have well, a well-defined uh, 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 well, uh, notion of security, which is a polynomial bounded adversary should not be able to provide us with a wrong answer along with a proof that verifies, okay? And so we're using computational assumptions here. Okay, so this is general framework. So let's see how we use this, how, how we implement our solution in this model now. And we're looking into sets collection, a bunch of sets. So if we go back to the three-party model, we have a source that owns sets one, two, three, four. Okay, it's just general sets. These sets are being outsourced to an untrusted server. And uh, there is a client here that says, okay, I want the server to compute an intersection of sets one and sets four. Okay, the server computes this intersection. As you can see there, the intersection is only one element, D. The answer is returned back to, uh, back to the user and there's also a proof there. Okay, now we have, and there's a verification. We can have another client now that asks for the intersection of sets S2 and S3. And the server comes back with an empty set because the intersection is just uh, empty and the proof. Now, the main contribution of this work and the main goal we're having here is that we would like this proof, so basically the proof that is returned, uh, the proof that is returned by the server to be asymptotically equal to the size of the answer. So if the intersection is very small, empty, we want the proof to be just constant. Okay. And the main novelty is that uh, we're able to achieve that and basically have a proof that doesn't take into consideration all the size of all the sets that are being intersected, for example. And we're basically doing that for multiple set operations, not only intersection, union, uh, difference query, and so on and so forth. Okay. And we're going to use the following notation. M is the number of sets that are stored. M capital is the sum of size of all the sets. T is the number of the queried sets. Delta is the number of the elements that are contained in the answer. And N is the sum of sizes of the, of the queried sets. Okay, so this notation is gonna be used in the following. So let's see some related work. So here this table shows related uh, work comparison for the case that we're looking into computing a proof of an intersection of a constant number of sets, okay? So if you use just collision resistant as function, uh, Devon Boo and others and uh, Yang and Papadias came up with a solution that doesn't increase the space at all, but the proof, as you can see here, is proportional to the size of the intersected sets. The proof is linear, okay? Then Morselli and others, by using some kind of uh, Bloom filters representation, they're able, uh, there's another solution that, again, the proof is, uh, is linear, okay? So when you try to get the proof down to delta, there was a solution uh, by Pank and Tan that appeared in the database community where the space goes up to M to the C. So basically, when you're basically trying to make the proof of the intersection as small as the number, you get a space complexity that is, is very inefficient. Space of the data structure, basically. And here, what we're, trying, what we're doing in this paper is achieving the best of both worlds. Basically having the space linear and maintaining a proof for the intersection and other set operations to be delta, which is asymptotically equal to uh, the size of the answer. Okay, so let's see uh, how we use our solution. So we have a set X with n elements, and this is going to be represented with a polynomial in ZP. Okay, so now, if Z is an intersection of X and Y, that means that the polynomial z of s is the great common divisor of x of s and uh, y of s, okay? And now, if the intersection is empty of two sets, that means that the polynomials x of s and y of s have great common divisor equal to one, which further by the extended Euclidean algorithm implies that there exists polynomial p of s, uh, p of s and q of s such that p of uh, s times x of s plus q of s times y of s equals one. So this is the test to be used in our proof. 
that will give us this uh, cool complexity assumption. And uh, the cryptography we're using is bilinear maps, where you have uh, two multiplicative groups, G and T of prime order P, and we have all the bilinear uh, setting here. And the assumption that we're using is the bilinear Q-strong Diffie-Hellman assumption, which is the Q-strong Diffie-Hellman assumption in the bilinear setting, where the challenge is basically outputting uh, this tuple at, at the last point. Okay, so let's see. Uh, we're also using a bilinear map accumulator. A bilinear map accumulator is a way of representing a set of elements in a very succinct way with some security. Okay, so if you have a set of elements in ZP and you have a base and a generator of the, of the bilinear map group and a secret S in ZP, you can basically represent this set with this digest. So this has, it's a constant size description of the whole set. And the good for this is basically that you can have a witness for any element in the set. And, and how this, uh, this witness is computed? This witness is computed basically by, okay. Uh, this witness is basically computed by omitting x from the exponent as ba and basically including everything else. So this is a witness that the element belongs to the set. And the verification is using the bilinear map, of course. So it takes the witness. It takes the witness and the element that you're trying to prove, and if you know that you have the correct digest, you can do the verification by using the bilinear map. This is a well-known method that has been proposed uh, in, in the past, and the security is based on the q strong hellman assumption. <coughs> so our construction works as follows. If you have all these four sets, you compute the bilinear map representation of every set, okay? And on top of that, you build something like a Merkle tree. Okay, this Merkle tree is special in the sense that it has constant uh, height and sublinear degree. And we use a different Merkle tree, not of logarithmic size, because we want to achieve our complexity goals. Okay, and we call this accumulation tree, and a similar construction was, was proposed uh, earlier uh, at CCS 2008. So the intuition here is that the accumulation digest of the sets protect the integrity of the sets, and the accumulation tree on top, which is kind of a different Merkle tree, protect the, protects the integrity of the accumulation digest. Okay, so let's see now how we compute the proof for the intersection, S1, uh, intersection S2. So first, the server has to compute the intersection. Okay, so this is set one, this is set two, and the intersection, as you can see, is C comma E. Okay. Uh, now, since we're intersecting sets S1 and S2, the server will return proofs about the accumulation digest that correspond to the sets S1 and S2. And to return these proofs, he's going to use the accumulation tree. Okay, so this is something external uh, to, to what's going on this level. Okay. And this, this, this proof basically is, is uh, some, some values along the path of this tree, and the construction takes a sublinear amount of time, and the size of the proof is constant. So this is the first part of the proof where you prove that the accumulation digest is a specific value. Now, you need to go inside the accumulation of the elements and do something more specific. Specifically, when C and T is the intersection of subset one and two, you need to prove a subset condition, namely that C and T both belong, is a subset of the first set and a subset of the second set. Okay, so in order to do that, you're gonna use the accumulation and provide a subset witness. Basically, since uh, the accumulation is G to everything in the set, the subset witness is gonna be G to everything in the set except for the elements you're querying for. So this is the first subset witness. And this is the second subset witness. As you can see here, it only, it only basically includes the elements that are left out, that do not belong to the intersection, H and Z here, and here F, D, A, and B, A, B, D, F, okay? So these are the two subset witnesses. And of course now we have to prove that in between the subset witnesses, there are nothing else in common, okay? So, okay, now just show the complexity of the subset witnesses in order to compute this. And so after you compute subject uh, witnesses, you need to make sure that what remains, if you remove the intersection, doesn't contain any more common elements, because the, the problem with, with doing intersection is basically proving the completeness. Okay. And if you have the subset witness to be 
g to the p of s and g to the q of s, then the completeness condition is basically g to the a s and g to the b s such that the polynomials that have been used here satisfy the extended Euclidean uh, algorithm condition. Okay? So basically, the proof is computed by using such polynomials that satisfy the, the extended Euclidean algorithm uh, 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 condition. And, and where P of S and Q of S are the subset witness polynomials. And this is important, that's why we, we need basically bilinear maps, because basically uh, this condition can only be verified, it's uh, internal product position uh, uh, condition, so can only be verified by using bilinear maps. And it comes very helpful. And in order to compute this completeness witnesses, we need n log square time. Okay, so let's see now what's the complexity of uh, our method. Uh, so the, the intersection, in order to compute the intersection, you need n time and the size is delta. In order to compute the accumulation value proofs, you need this amount of time, m to the epsilon log m, and the size is t. The subset witnesses, you need n log n, this comes from fast forget as for basically all these operations here, that's why it's n log n, and the size is t. The completeness witnesses, you do the extended Euclidean algorithm, and this is the complexity you get by using FFT and the size is t, and you end up having something that is t plus delta. So basically the proof, the proof for the intersection is t plus delta, where t is the, the number of the sets you're querying, and delta is the size of, of the intersection. Okay, and this is almost optimal, basically. Okay, and almost is because uh, in order to compute the proof, you have this extra logarithmic cost, whereas just computing the intersection is just linear. But in terms of uh, size of the proof, it's just optimal. Okay, and to see uh, how this compares in practice with other solutions, we computed, we simulated the size of the proof in terms of bytes. So here we compare with the solution that appeared in Infocom uh, in 2004. And uh, this, we're actually using the numbers they're using in their paper. And the first column is the this, this number of elements in the first set. The second column is the number of elements in the second set. And the third column is the size of the intersection. And here, as, as we can see, most of the time our proof is always, uh, is, is, is Excuse me. Yes. So this is uh, kilobytes. It's, it's the world by the work by Morselli and others that appeared in 2004, and this is the kilobytes of this work. Okay. And here uh, it just happens that the constant we're using uh, happen to be a lot a lot bigger. So, so that's why. But but generally, as you can see, if you go down to big number of sets, uh, big sets and small intersection sizes. Our, the size of our proof is, is basically proportional to, to the size of, of the answer, whereas this takes into consideration all the, all the sets. And with that slide, I would like to conclude my talk. Thank you. Okay, we have time for a question or two. Yes. yes. Excuse me? Uh, we're in the middle of, uh, of building a system, but uh, it's in the works. We, 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 we're working on that. So at that point, I was, I was only able to, to get the simulations, basically, of, of the proof. Because you really know exactly what is contained in the proof and how, how big is it, so you can easily simulate. Yes? Yes, I mentioned, yes, I was only able to, to show the intersection, but in the paper we will describe how you can do all the set operations. Basically, union, uh, difference, which, which is re really tricky to, to get actually, and subset, subset. Uh, yes, one more question. Yes. Yes. So yes, it's going to be uh, uh, the complexity is going to be as 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 big uh, proportional to the number to the size of all the sets. 
No, no, no. It, it doesn't have to do, uh, to do with the space of the queries. It only has to do with how many sets you have and how big are the individual sets. Okay, so you, you don't do any pre-computation of the space in the space query. So it, it's just a number of dimensions. It can be like two to the, two to the n that would be, right? Uh, well, it's a polynomially bounded server, yes. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, no, it has to be polynomial. I mean, it can be two to the n. I don't know if, yeah. Okay, let's uh, thank the speaker again. Okay.